Awesome. So I am Christina Beckford. Um, I'm currently a recent um, graduate. I live close to um, the Philadelphia and now I'm a software engineer. Thank you for doing this and taking this time with me, Christina. I appreciate that. So my first wow. question is, what did you do before tech? Before tech, I was in the Army. So I worked, in, I worked as a petroleum supply specialist for about four and a half years, and I joined the Army at High School. So that was my prior background experience. Thank you for your service. I genuinely appreciate that. So what, why tech? What attracted you to tech? The beautiful thing, what I love about tech is the innovation being able to take a set of tools, because I'm also a very creative person. So I love how, specifically software engineering, you can um, take creativity and logic and be able to take these tools and build something. So that's always been my fascination with technology. The, the, the unlimited possibilities you can do with it, with the, with the tools that we have today. So that's what really drew me in since I was um, back in high school. That's awesome. Uh, what was one of the hardest challenges coming into tech? Oh, the respect, getting, gaining respect from other males. And I'm not just talking just, uh, I'm not just talking Caucasian, just males in general, just gaining respect that I have the same, I have the ability to be just, just as good as they are. So I always felt like I always had to prove myself. And I'm not just talking like in a college setting, I'm talking work experience as, as well. So it's always like that little chip on my shoulder. Like Absolutely, my I can term. see that. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're showing them because, you know, you're phenomenal in so many ways. But so as a strong black woman, what is a struggle that you face in the industry and how have you overcome that? A struggle that I face in the industry, I, I get that. The biggest thing I say is, is um, opportunity, honestly, because, I've, because um, if I could compare myself to another um, peer of mine, we went to the same school. We have the same amount of um, qualifications. We both have internships, but for some reason, he's getting all the calls. Um, for me, it was a little bit more of a struggle to get interviews. Um, it took me about like, um, like almost seven months before I got my first full-time um, position. I had intern experience, but I was trying to land a full-time position. So for me personally, it was um, landing opportunities and getting people to understand that um, to value my work and value my worth. And I'm just as good as, <laughs> I'm just as good as any other developer. You know, just to oversee the fact that I'm a female and, you know, the double token. So that's my biggest struggle. But the interesting is that once people do get to know me, I kind of earn their respect very quickly. Once I'm in there and I kind of show what I can do, then the respect is there. But beforehand, it's always a struggle when they just don't know. They're like, oh. I could see that because I know, you know, from our brief interaction, I've, I'm, I have a ton of respect for you. So you've gone through so much and you've done a phenomenal job. Uh, what would be one piece of advice that you could offer to someone to be, help them become more welcoming and accepting of a person of color? One piece of advice. Um, the best I think, best thing, best advice I can give you is, um, is be your, be yourself. Honestly, as you try to, come off as someone who just becomes like a know-it-all. I met people who are, who are like, they just, you know, come off as their know-it-alls, they know a lot of things. And, but honestly, people just like, um, you know, your personality, just be yourself, honestly. And if, if they don't like you for who you are, then that, that, that should tell you that you shouldn't be a part of that company. So just be true to yourself. That's the best advice I can give you. That's awesome. And you've, you're doing a lot right now. So like, what is a goal of yours that you're trying to accomplish in this industry? So my main, my top goal, I always want to own my, I want to own my own software company. So, because I, I want to tackle a lot of in social injustice issues, especially in Philadelphia. There's, there's a whole ton, just like the rest of the country is. So I would love to like have a team that focuses on developing apps and, um, and programs to help people with those social injustice issues. You know, my biggest passion is um, food insecurity. In Philadelphia, in Philadelphia alone, um, there isn't enough produce available for low-income families. There are more McDonald's in low-income cities than fresh fruits and vegetables. So, um, so like last year, I created an app called You Farm, and you were able to like lo you put in your zip code, and you're able to locate to the nearest um, urban farm area, you know, in, in your neighborhood, and they give away free produce. So that's more like wow. an informational awareness type of app but I can see myself having a team dedicated to that, you know, because we have the tools, the technology is there. We're able to give people more awareness, you know, and everybody has cell phones. So why not? I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, Christina Beckford, software engineer, thank you for doing this with me. I enjoyed this very much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. Hope we do this again. All right. Hello, I am Natalie Davis. I am a full stack boot camper, web dev, um, and I'm excited to be here having this conversation. Hey Natalie, I'm thank you. Thank you so much for doing this with me. You know, I genuinely appreciate you taking your time to do this. So my first question would be, why tech? What attracted you to tech? So I had a pretty long and successful career in retail. Um, and not to diminish retail work by any means. It's incredibly necessary. It's integral to the functioning of society. But it wasn't fulfilling me anymore. I re reached a point where while there were still things to learn, I wasn't being truly challenged. So I started looking at like the different options that I could have. Um, some things were closed off to me. I wasn't interested in another $100,000 worth of student loan debt. Um, I definitely wanted to do impactful work, but there are some things that prevent me from going into like the medical field and things like that. And then I just started paying attention to the world around me and I started seeing these articles about how algor algorithms had implicit bias built into them and how that was affecting my community. And that made it really clear that like the future is being written via code and it's time for more people like me to sit down at the keyboard and make sure we're a part of that. Absolutely. So what about tech in particular do you find yourself going towards? What would you like to learn more about? What doors would you like open for yourself? Sure. Well, like I said, I'm currently studying, uh, studying and have a good handle on web development, but my secret like desire is to move into data science at some point. And I think the combination of being able to develop a user friendly site along with the power that understanding how to use data and present that to an audience would just be incredibly valuable and also another chance to put a different perspective out there. Absolutely. What is one thing that you find being very challenging for you at this stage in your career? Um, I think the most challenging thing for me at this stage of my career is just moving from having like a rock solid resume where I no longer had to interview, recruiters would find me, I'd make that change when I want to, to just starting from scratch again and having to reprove myself as capable. Absolutely. I totally sympathize with that. That's exactly what happened to me on my way in. So one question I have, though, and uh, we kind of talked about this before, but you're making this transition late in life. What yeah. is daring and interesting enough for you to make this transition now? And do you feel like maybe uh, you have to work a little bit harder due to your circumstances? I absolutely do. I mean, coming into this industry that seems to be pretty youth centric at 40 is an additional challenge to my goal. But I've never ever been afraid of a challenge. And when I looked at like the bigger picture of things, I've still got at least 25 years left in this workforce. And I had to decide whether I was going to spend 25 years earning a comfortable salary, but being really miserable, or if I was willing to take a risk and change things up so that the next 25 years in the workforce could be spent doing something I truly want to do. Now, I know at this stage, it's got to be tough. You're going through it. What is something that keeps you persevering through these trying times? The importance of my voice being out there. Absolutely. Um, no group is a monolith. I've had a, a myriad of really unique, unique life experiences that causes me to view things probably from a much broader perspective than, than some people do, and certainly from a perspective that some people have never considered. And I think until we're really kind of listening to all the voices that exist in this country, we're going to continue to see turmoil. But it's not enough for me to just sit at home and think about those things. I have to position myself to be heard. And one of the ways that I can do that is by developing a rock solid skill set that no one can argue with. And I think that coding offers that because you can say what you want about me being female or me being black or me being elder or me being a combination of those three things. But what you can't do is argue with my code. It works. Absolutely. I always say code is colorblind. You know, we, we make it do what we want it to do. So 
this comes to this very important question that I have to ask. As a strong black woman, I'm going to go ahead and throw strong in there because I know you. As a strong black woman, what is one piece of advice that you can give to someone to be more welcoming and accepting of a person of color? Um, I mean, a part of it's got to do with self-education. There's not like a simple answer to that. But I guess if I had to like dilute it down and really simplify it, be empathetic, be a human being, like be more than the sum of your limited education. I love that. All right, Natalie Davis, future software engineer and data scientist. Thank you. I appreciate you taking this time with me. Danny, thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. All right, Erica, this is me letting you know on the record that we are recording, and at any time that you want to stop this recording, all you have to do is say stop, all right? So the way we'll start this is <clears throat> me clearing my throat first, and then uh, just introduce yourself, and we'll go from there. All right. All right, so my name is Erica Miles, and I am an Atlanta-based front-end web developer. Thank you for doing with us, me, Erica. You know personally that you're a huge inspiration of mine, so I thank you for taking the time out to do this with me. So my very first question, we'll just get started right away, is what did you do before tech? Before tech, um, I did various things like retail, customer service, mostly in that vein, and then I was an auto claims adjuster right before transitioning into tech. That's awesome. So why tech? Funny thing, my sister-in-law had posted um, a story about like top careers without a college degree. Um, It was at a point where I had ran out of student aid, like financial aid for school, and the degree I previously was pursuing biology wasn't one that would be covered by my employer's tuition reimbursement. So I was like, well, what can I do? And tech came up and it sounded like something that was always changing so I wouldn't get bored. Um, It was a vast field. I'm a person who kind of likes a lot of things. So it's hard to pigeonhole myself into one thing that I like. Um, And I'm not going to lie, there's a chance to make some good money. (laughs) So I'm used to making like minimum wage and stuff like that. So that's pretty much what got me interested in the first place. (laughs) That's awesome. So what was one of your hardest challenges coming into tech? It's so much information and it requires like so much effort to go into it in order to like be able to do things. Like I've kind of been a person where like in school, I'd like wait to the last minute to do assignments and somehow magically still pull off an A. So getting introduced to something that didn't automatically stick after just like glancing at it the first time, that was really kind of like breathtaking. I was like, whoa, like, am I not as smart as I thought I was? Or like, what's this about? It's just it's just a matter of there being like a whole lot of information to take in. So getting used to that and getting, wrapping my mind, like changing my mindset, like thinking, okay, you have to put effort into this. You can't just like skate by and think you're going to be successful. That was like the hardest thing for me to get my mind around. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I really, I always feel like I have to work five times as hard as someone else just to retain the information. Forget about, you know, coding, but just to understand what's going on. What's the question? (laughs) Uh, as a black woman in tech, what struggles have you faced in this industry and how have you overcome it? Well, I'm lucky to say the people I like work with in person directly day to day, like everyone's really inclusive and really welcoming. Um, but I do know like outside of that circle, sometimes there's kind of this feeling of people kind of like try to test my knowledge or kind of dig deeper to see if I really know what I'm talking about that I don't think that they always extend to other people. So that's a little bit frustrating because I'm like, well, this is a skill-based industry. So obviously I have the skills to be here, but yet you're questioning me and I can't help but wonder why that is. (laughs) So, but you know, I have have thickish skin and kind of have to work through it, but it's frustrating nonetheless. That's a very common answer that I'm hearing today, to be honest with you. Uh, What piece of advice would you offer someone to be more welcoming and accepting of a person of color? Um, It's going to sound direct, and I don't 
mean it to be like rude or anything, but check your bias. It's something that we all can do. Um, and sometimes we do things without even thinking about it that like let our bias influence our interactions with people. So just sometimes before you want to question someone's ability or skills or, you know, kind of think like, well, how did they end up there? Kind of take a step back and think like, would I ask this to somebody else? Um, or just kind of like treat people like you're equal because then it's a lot easier for like organic interactions and things like that to occur. Um, and for people to also be more comfortable with you. I like that. What is a goal of yours that you you want to accomplish in this industry? What are you trying to accomplish? Oh, that is a good question. So I've always kind of been one of those people. And it's kind of what really got me burnt out in retail and stuff. I always feel like I should have some kind of purpose behind what I'm doing. Like I want to do impactful work. So folding clothes and stocking shelves at Target just wasn't hitting it. No offense for anyone who works at Target, but for me, I wasn't <laughs> able to pull a deeper meaning out of that. Um, so hopefully I don't know exactly how that looks just yet, but I'd like to be someone who has an impact on other people and motivates other people and helps them realize that they too can like succeed in whatever it is that they want to do. That's awesome. And if you were to give a piece of advice to a beginner or someone new in the industry, what would that be? Be consistent. Like, even if it's like a small amount of consistency, even if it's 30 minutes a day, it totally adds up over time. You build like the habit through the repetition and you will get to where you're going as long as you're focused and consistent. <laughs> Erica, front end developer. Thank you for doing this with me. I enjoyed every second of this conversation. Thank you, Danny. I enjoyed talking to you as well. Uh, my name is Laren Hampton. I am founder and CEO of Bison Mindset, an uh, IT consulting company for tech schools and, and universities, and uh, excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you learn, you know, uh, I've always appreciated you. So thank you for taking this time to be with me. So I'm just going to start yeah. with the first question. What did you do before tech? Oh, before tech, I was in the marketing world. Uh, my roots started with the Dallas Morning News uh, back when the, the newspaper was a hot thing. Uh, but I actually ran the, uh, the digital side of the house. So I was in charge of all of the automotive segments uh, when it came to strategic marketing and, and advertising. That's awesome. That's awesome. So why yeah. tech? You know what? I've always had a passion for innovation uh, in, in technology, and I knew it was the inevitable. I think I fought it early on. Uh, but, you know, I had the opportunity. There was a massive, massive layoff. I think this is when the economy truly tanked uh, around 2008, 2009. Um, so around that time frame, uh, when we had a lot of layoffs, I actually didn't get caught in those layoffs. But I used the opportunity to pivot. You know, I realized, you know what? I think the, the marketing world, especially in media, is starting to shift a little bit, which it did. Um, I think this is a great chance for me to jump into tech, right? Let me find my entry point to just get my foot in the door and, and really make something happen. So uh, around that time frame, I used that opportunity to just truly jump into tech. So I, I started with a, a mom and pop IT shop, nonetheless. It was a startup uh, that, that ended up being very successful, and, and that was my entry point. I took off from there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what was one of your hardest challenges coming into tech, especially for marketing? Um, I, I think for me was understanding how to humanize relationships. I, I thought coming in that I had to know every and anything when it comes to technology. So I completely overthought that. Right. And so as I got to get, you know, I got to know, you know, fellow techies, I started to realize, wait, they're human just like me. You know, why am I yeah. thinking? You know, and, and, but getting to know the lingo, uh, the terminologies and all the things there. But I think my biggest challenge was myself, right? Um, I, I got away from who I really was early on because I thought I needed to be someone different, you know, to fit into the tech world. And man, I quickly realized probably a month or two in, like that was a terrible idea. Authenticity was, was key for me. So that was the biggest challenge for me, uh, I, I think. And then from there, man, once I got rid of the, the carbon copy approach, uh, it, it was upwards from there. So, so as a black male, what are some of the struggles that you face in this industry and how did you overcome them? Um, I think for me, you know, definitely face racism for sure and bias. Um, I overcame them from just ignoring them. 
right? And, and it doesn't mean that it's not there, uh, but I, I didn't give it as much energy. I made my goal more important because what I started to realize was there were other African-American males, whether they're friends, associates, they were paying attention to my decision-making and paying attention to what I was doing. You know, even today in tech, you know, you still don't have a lot of, you know, people of color that are in tech or there's a story that, you know, oh, you, you know, you have to come from a certain school or you have to be a certain way to be in tech and it's just not true. And I think I've always had that in mind. So, you know, when I would face those barriers, man, whether it was closing a deal or whether it was getting, getting an opportunity or moving up the ranks, you know, in tech, um, I did, you know, I faced bias, I faced racism. Um, but I just felt like I went around it, right? Um, I never allowed another individual or, or, or perception to, to allow me to slow down, right? I always had the, the, the pedal, the foot on the pedal, right? Gas yeah, all the way down. So um, that's always been my mindset um, for sure. But doesn't mean that racism isn't there, man. It's, it's, uh, it's probably the biggest challenge I face for sure throughout my career. What would be a piece of advice that you could offer to someone to be more welcoming and accepting of a person of color? Oh, I think it comes down to humanizing, right? You know, yeah, look, we have a tons of different races out there, right? But I think understanding the common denominator for everyone is that we're the human race, right? And we, we you have African Americans, you have, you know, Asians, you have so many different variety of, of ethnicities out there. But the common denominator is that we are equal. We all are human. Um, and I think educating yourself about that person's ethnicity or culture uh, is, is key, too, so you can fully understand that person's background, but also understand they're human, right? They're going to like basketball games just like you. They're going to love going to those restaurants just like you. Nothing's different, right? We may have different upbringings or cultural backgrounds or, again, different ethnicities, but humanize it, right? At the end of the day, we're all human. Love that. So yeah. what is a goal that you have that you're trying to accomplish in this industry? You know, um, I definitely have an individual goal to impact others, right? I want to make sure all of the different accolades is great, but I want to leave something behind. I want to leave a clear path, right? If I use the analogy of sports, right, like NFL football, for example, if I view myself as a, let's say, an offensive lineman that's creating a path for the running back, right? I want to create a path for other people to follow, it, you know, particularly people of color. I want them to know, you know, if you have a dream, you have a goal, you can go get it. I mean, period. And nothing stops you. Even racism, bias, it, it doesn't matter. You can still go get that thing, right? So the ultimate goal for me is make a huge impact, right? I want to educate and show maybe even people that do have a little bit of bias and racism and show them that, hey, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is creating that clear path. I want to leave a legacy, not just for my kids and my own family, but I want to leave a legacy for people that are trying to figure it out, that want an opportunity, right? That want to see their dreams fulfilled. I want to make that path a little bit more clearer, right? Folks that may be on a similar path that I'm on, I want to leave something for them and make their job just a little bit easier to, to, to go out and get it. So, um, I, I think that's the, the ultimate goal for me. Lauren Hampton, founder of Bison Mindset. Thank you, sir. I appreciated you this got it. and I enjoyed every second. Thank you. Likewise. All right. Well, hello. My name is Lawrence Lockhart. I'm a developer here in the Memphis, Tennessee area, even though I live in North Mississippi, to be technical, representing Mississippi. And I'm glad to be here today. Thank you, Lawrence. I genuinely appreciate you doing this with me. So I, I want to start this off because I know you, you're a huge inspiration of mine. What did you do before tech? What was your life before tech? Before tech? Oh, gosh. I did whatever I had to do to pay the bills, whatever I had to do to eat. Um, I had a college plan, and I went there and completely blew that opportunity, and I just kind of fell into the restaurant industry. I didn't have, like, this big goal to be a restaurant manager. It's like when you don't have marketable skills, there are certain ways you just kind of end up restaurant, retail, warehouse. And there's some very skilled people in those industries, but I wasn't one of them. I just kind of did it because I had to keep gas in the car and I had to eat. Um, I started off in fast food, and the main thing with fast food is you have to be fast and you have to know how to talk to people. So I learned how to do those things, and I went from making the ice cream to being the assistant manager, then the general manager, and then I was just blowing up from one restaurant to the next. Kind of convinced myself I liked it, and uh, 15, 16 years later, I was still in the restaurant field. So I've been flipping burgers and 
and making customers happy for a long time in the restaurant field. That's awesome. So why tech? Why tech? I guess the better question for me is why not tech? So I mentioned bombing out from college, right? My whole plan like for life was a technical career from grade school. I was always the, the science fair guy, the math club guy. I enjoyed math classes and, you know, my math teachers were my favorite teachers and that was my plan. And like I said, I just took an opportunity to go in that direction and blew it. Too young, too immature, no discipline. And it's ended up in the restaurant field. And so basically ended up taking a very long route, like going around the world to visit my neighbor next door kind of route to end up in tech. But that was always where my passion was. One of my favorite things as a kid to do was read popular science magazines and just sit in my bed and look at futuristic cars and the artist renderings of moon rovers. I would do that for fun, but I blew it. Uh, The cool thing is we kind of have a mantra in my family. As long as you're still alive and you're still interested, there's no such thing as too late. And so many years later, I came across opportunities and and great people like you and many others that inspired me to get started in the tech. So just for this, how old were you when you made your transition into tech? Let's see, 47 now. I first had an inkling around 43, 43, 44. And That's it was, wrong. I was actually in between two different restaurants. I was working with a career counselor and she gave me all these tests, like, you know, the Myers Briggs and just like a bunch of them. And to my surprise, it actually rated me very high for technical acumen and logical skills and reasoning skills and mathematical skills, which surprised the heck out of me because I hadn't touched a book or done any kind of problem solving in a, a very long time. So I was like, okay, well, what kind of careers does this end up, you know, can this lead to? And it was like actuary. And I looked at what an actuary was. I thought, oh, heck no, I'm not doing that. that. That sounds very boring. And then the next one was like software engineer, developer, web developer. And I thought, well, what's that? And looked it up, checked it out. And I said, I can do this. And just started hitting a bunch of self-taught resources. Didn't really know what my direction was. And so I kind of lost a lot of time there, just kind of wandering from one thing to the next, but eventually found my way. What was one of your hardest challenges coming into tech? One of the hardest challenges was probably my own brain, just believing I belonged here. You know, when you have a picture and kind of a mode and a model in your mind of what a certain type of people are or what a certain type of industry, what kind of people they are, and you don't see yourself like that, it is a monumental task to get over that hump. Like, that's a huge hurdle. Um, And that just took being around a lot of encouraging people, reading examples. I'll never get tired of reading the blogs, watching the YouTube videos of how I made it, you know, how I made it to engineer in nine months or two years. I'll never get tired of those because those reinforce the idea to me that it can be you too. Uh, but that was my biggest hurdle. And a lot of times, like I said, I started when I was 43, 44. I would go for a while, six, nine months, get discouraged, and I would just stop. And you probably know if you just get away from coding when you're first learning and then come back two months later, you've forgotten everything. <laughs> you're oh, at yeah. square zero. So that was one of my biggest hurdles because it caused me to waste even more time. As a black male coming into this industry, what was like, what were struggles that you face in this industry? How did you overcome them? Interesting. So full transparency, I, in my tech career, not in my life, because I got a lot of stories I can tell you about life and not in my restaurant career, because I got some, mm, some booger bear stories in that career. But in my tech journey, I have actually not had any of the issues that you might think of associated with racism or sexism or any of the other isms, um, which is amazing. And that's actually kind of fodder for me to say, hey, I know a whole lot of other people are going through stuff. What can I do to make life better for them? Um, I've been surrounded by so many amazing people that were open, that were honest, that were showing me the way. Even where I work at FedEx, they have made so many great grounds with their diversity inclusion efforts, resource groups, Um, very proud to work there, very proud of their efforts. So I haven't run into those barriers, but I say that actually from kind of a position of privilege, knowing a lot of other people have, like a ton of folks just hit glass ceilings before they get started. So I really try to endeavor myself. What can I do to help somebody else? What would be a piece of advice that you can give to someone to be more welcoming and accepting of a person of color? Wow, that's a great question. And very timely. Uh, And let me just say this very conference, Juneteenth, and shout out to you for all your efforts in this. 
Michael Brown, the guys from Microsoft, and all the team for putting this together because it's very necessary. Um, you know, the adage is we're all the same, right? We, we, we're all the same. We all bleed the same red blood. We're all equal. Race shouldn't matter. Sex shouldn't matter. And the advice to get to that point is make decisions where race, sex, color, creed, background doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, and I put it in real plain language in, in one of the Slack groups I'm in, you, know, you got to get rid of the racists. <laughs> you got to be honest. You have to be honest about it. That is not a, a left or a right or a Republican or a de the Democratic philosophy. It's a philosophy that is anti-business. And so for whatever business and whatever corporation you run and you make decisions in, if there are people who are going to be against people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different geographies within the country, they have to be removed from positions of power and allow people that look at all of us as being the same to make decisions. Then we're going to get there. I completely agree with that. What is the goal of yours that you want to accomplish in this industry? Man, I have so many goals. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always coming up with more goals. Like, you know, yeah. cause you know, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And like, this thing is really big. And then you learn more stuff like this could be even bigger. But just for the sake of brevity, I'm looking forward to kind of just to riff on what I just said. I'm looking forward to the day that my example, my efforts, my presence in this space can make it where my young kids and your young kid and their kids can go into any industry they want to and know the only thing that matters is the value they bring to that company. Straight up. And so a lot of what I do is yes, for my company to, you know, increase our stock share and our market value. But a lot of what I do is to help open doors, knock down barriers, kill stereotypes so that our kids and the kids that come behind them don't experience the social unrest that we're doing right now to try to get over that hump. That is a huge goal of mine. And if someone was new in the industry or learning or about to join the industry, what would be one piece of advice that you'd bestow upon them? Biggest piece of advice, number one, is never too late and don't give up. Absolutely. And I honestly gave up many times on this journey when I didn't think I could make it. I didn't think I was cut out for it. Maybe I'm just too old. Maybe my brain doesn't function the right way anymore. All kinds of negative beliefs. Just don't give up. If you're interested, you have the acumen for this, you can do it. Break. I'm sweating. <clears throat> ah, wow. All right. Cool. You're good. All right. And Lawrence Lockhart, software engineer, developer extraordinaire. Thank you for doing this with me. I genuinely appreciate you. Hey, man, anything for you, Daddy? Follow Daddy Thomas. That guy's cool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Sultan. I can say Sultan. I'm a front end developer and also a developer advocate. A lot of my work cuts across Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Zambia. And my major focus is helping out beginner developers here in Africa scale through my nonprofit. The nonprofit is Dev Career. So what we do in Dev Career is we support underrepresented developers with laptop courses, mentorship, and subscription to hubs and internet and electricity. So it's a way for us to build up the local ecosystem here. And a lot of amazing people that want to come into tech, but they don't have the financial capabilities. Uh, for those that don't know Sultan, he, I'm a huge fan of his. I've been following him for a while. He is a developer. He provides laptops to aspiring developers that pass certain criteria that would show that they would basically do well in this field. So it's going to people that can actually utilize it to its full capability. Um, I also believe he probably fights crime part of the time because he's so amazing. He does so many <laughs> amazing things. Uh, I guess the first question I want to ask is, what did you do before tech? Okay, well, it's kind of an interesting answer. So you see, what actually brought me into tech was not because I, I it was not actually because I wanted to code or so. Just because I was looking for cheap internet, actually. So internet is to be very expensive. The dollar, like a dollar, like three dollars should get you just, was it 100 megabytes? If you could do that math now, three dollars was yeah. about 100 megabytes before. The way I learned how to code was really, really tricky because I learned it upside down. I learned, I learned from PHP. I, oh. I can't, I'm telling you, I started from PHP. And then I, I went back, I went to, was it, was it JavaScript? 
then to CSS, HTML, HTML was what I learned last. <laughs> what I thought HTML was for is, oh, you want to create a table, go and copy how it is and come back to the website. That was it. So you've helped a lot of people with your organization dev careers. How many people have you helped and what do you see as your way to continue to be providing resources to people in that area? So we've run, we have two cohorts right now in dev career. The first cohort, we had 22 developers. So both male and female. And it was just in Nigeria only. So it was in three states in Nigeria, Lagos, Abuja, and all your states. That was the first pilot program. We had to just run things. And we, we raised 5,000 pounds on GoFundMe. And wow. we got support on, on ISAMS. So that was how we were able to afford the laptops and courses. We partnered with Pluralsight also. Pluralsight gave us the courses. Yeah, thanks to Julia Laman. She was the one who made that possible with Pluralsight. Wow. All right, so which in 22 developers and I think right now, about 70% of them are now working as a software developer in various companies. Like, I think that number is huge for me. I was expecting maximum of 50, but the, 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 the first cohort ended in November last year. And as of now, about more, even more than 70% of them, at least the first who got a job for after finishing Dev career, got the offer before the program finished. That was the first wow. person who got a job, got an offer wow. before the program finished. <laughs> At a three-stage selection process. One was the first registration where we select based on states and numbers. Then the second one was an aptitude test to get into Dev career. Then after that, you do a coding test. So after then, if you now pass those two tests, the test is just basics for the mobile phone. If you pass that, then you can now come for a physical interview. So the second cohort is now, and it's in Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, and Kenya. Now, the reason is because Nigeria is not the only country in Africa. And that was how we started up with Ghana, Zambia, and Kenya. But then we are still in Nigeria also. Nigeria is the base. <laughs> so, of course, we're still in Nigeria also. But then the vision is not just Nigeria alone. As long as we can help you in Africa, we'll try our possible best to help you with that. So, in total, you've given away 72 laptops. Yeah, 72 laptops now. That's amazing. And you're, you're still... So... What is your overall goal? Like, what are you trying to achieve in total with dev careers? Like, what's the big picture? It can't be to just hand out 10 laptops here and there. Like, what do you really want to do? Yeah, well, now, when somebody asked me how we are actually seeing our, how we are calculating our progress in dev career, before I would have said, oh, it's just the people we train. If we're able to train 1,000 people in the next three years, I mean, those fancy, fancy stuff you read online, that was my answer before. But then, when I saw that, okay, this is way beyond training. I mean, these are people that they've never had a job before. There are, some of them have finished the university and some have yet to even get into university. And now, they have a life. I mean, they are working as a developer and they love it and they are growing with time. So I think it's more like you empowering and you supporting people's life and career. It's not just about tech any longer. It's about you trying to empower fellow Africans and try to support their career in different parts you could. We do front-end with React, back-end with Node.js, data science with Python and Android. The first cohort, we used Java and Kotlin for Android, but now we're using Flutter for mobile app. So you could, it's, all, it's cross-platform. So it's all about the life, the improvement of life. It's not just about the tech, 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 tech. So I think that would, that's like the base good. That's like the vision I'm seeing, that we could improve the quality of lives of people over here with the tech that we know. A lot of people are doing this with different aspects in their particular field. So I'm a tech guy. I feel this is the way I can do it with tech also, which is, which is just for that for me. To be honest, that's what motivates me as well. I used to be so obsessed with trying to make the most money, trying to make, you know, get as much as I can <laughs> for myself. And then something happened. And now I no longer really care about trying to make the most money for myself. I'm exactly. focused on how many lives can I affect and I really get so much joy when someone reaches their goal that they're striving for. When I see someone get their first job in tech, they almost oh, want to cry. They're so happy. I, I'm telling you, I, the, the feeling is amazing. When somebody yeah. sent me a message by, was it, I think it was 2 a.m. I was like, oh, I just got a job right now. I was like, wow, this was a long time ago. The, the, the lady was sent a voice note and she was very happy that this was my first job. I never believed that I could do it. Like, well. Oh. Welcome, welcome to the club. Somebody That's sent me it. a message also recently. It was midnight also. I think probably 11 p.m. I woke up the next morning and I saw the message. <laughs> like, she said, it's like, I couldn't keep it 
see with the money. Let me just quickly tell you now. So, so that so that feeling is really amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm able to do more. So one thing that we discussed is there is a big problem uh, with Nigerian candidates applying to companies that want to hire international workers, but they don't want Nigerians. They're showing favoritism to other countries. Can can you uh, tell me about that? Well, it's 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 in a lot of companies, and it's it's really something that that actually affects me a lot. Maybe not physically, not not personally, but I've seen this community strive to actually achieve achieve certain goals and certain milestones. And when it, when the issue of nationality just comes in, it's like a road blocker. I've seen amazing developers that they are really amazing and they are great and they are good. I mean, when you meet developers that are good, you know this person is good. And then they apply to a company, and after passing all the stages, the only the only roadblock there was, oh, you're an Nigerian? No, I'm sorry. I think there was a time where the company actually said, okay, if you can leave Nigeria and come over here, and then we would apply, we would actually accept you. But you can't stay in Nigeria and work for us. Things things like that is is not really helping the ecosystem. Now there are some companies that there are a lot of reasons why companies won't hire from Nigeria. It's on them. You can't actually force a company to hire from a certain country. It's acceptable. But the issue is when you allow a candidate to actually apply, to take your tests, to have several calls with you, only for you to say, oh, you qualified, but we can't accept you because you're in Nigeria. Okay, we ain't going to force you. It's not a must. You come to your office or so. But just don't let people go through that stress. It's draining. It's not cool. That, that's just what I can say about that. I agree. It's tough to go through the entire process and then be told that you're not allowed to apply because you're from Nigeria instead yeah, of exactly. letting you know on the front end, you know, we're not considering that country. Like we would consider, yeah. for example, Egypt, which is in Africa, but we're not going to consider Nigeria. Ex- exactly. I, I get that. So my question now is what would be a piece of advice that you would give to a new beginner or an aspiring developer? What would you tell them uh, to keep doing? Well, I think somebody asked me this question yesterday. Was it Tejas? And I think the answer I gave was still the one I would want to give now. The the three things that I I said was, it's easier for you to learn if you know the model that works for you. If you are the kind that loves watching video tutorials, then it's good to look for amazing courses that have videos for you to watch. If you are the type that actually loves reading, you prefer reading, then look for courses that are actually text written for you to learn from. The best way for you to learn is faster is when you actually use the model that suits you. So I might, I might be actually be good with watching video tutorials and I grab the concept at once. Someone else might decide that, oh, I have to actually read a tutorial in the form of text and not just watch the video. So if you're able to actually check out the best model that works for you when it comes to learning, I think you'll be able to cover a lot of ground faster, saves you time and it, 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 it makes your growth faster. That's one. Then number two is the, the use of most memories actually. So that's the more you learn, try and double up the speed. When it, try, not the speed, actually. Try and double up the number or the time frame when it comes to practicing. So if you learn, if you read for one hour, try practicing for twice that number. Because if, if, let's say if you're learning Angular, I started writing Angular recently, and it, it was really funny because, okay, let me use that as an example. Now, if you're, using, if you're reading an Angular tutorial now, like as a beginner, and, oh, you see that, okay, you, this, you have to start with ng start. I mean, those things that, those words, those keywords are so small that you feel that, oh, I know it, I don't need to write it. So you feel, oh, I don't need to write ng start. I don't need to write this. I don't need to write this. Before you know, there are like 17 things that you felt, they are just so simple for me to write the git in it, things like that. And before you know, you've even forgotten them already. So although they might yeah. look insignificant, but if it's part of the process, practice it. That, that's just what I would want to say about that. And also, I think I said three things. Yeah, talk to people and communicate also. It's, it's really helpful. You ask questions. So you, you might be an introvert. You don't have to familiarize with everybody. But when you're learning, try and reach out to people and ask questions. If you need a course on something, ask, oh, I want to learn, I want to learn Python. What course do you think you can recommend? It's easier than trying to do everything on your own. You are free to ask for help. The third experience is the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your own experience. It could be somebody else's own, somebody's else experience. If I ask you now, that, okay, I want to learn TypeScript, what course would you recommend to me? If you are a TypeScript expert, you can tell me that, oh, use this particular course. I find it really amazing. 
instead of me going about buying different courses and dumping them, I could just save myself the time and the stress and just based on your recommendation, have a good tutorial on TypeScript and that's it. So I, I think that's what I would want to say. If, if we have anyone that wants to donate, how could they go about donating to your organization to help out? All right, all right. So you could donate a laptop, you could donate a monetary donations, and you can even donate your skills. So if you just go to devcarrier.io, D-E-V-C-A-R-E-R.io, so there's, there's a part, just the homepage, you will see the link to our GoFundMe and the link to our Patreon there. And also, if you'd want to donate laptops, my handle is Axelton, and devcarrier's handle is D-E-V underscore carriers. So you could just send us a DM and we'll work out the shipping details. Sultan, Dev Careers, developer, thank you. I enjoyed every <laughs> single moment of this interview. <laughs>